Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Don Corder, who is Jim Corder, the founder of Corder Drums, uh, on the show. Don, welcome. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, so Corder is one of those uh, really cool brands that I, I, I think a lot of drummers know about, but um, it's it's really, uh, it's got a unique history. Um, and uh, first off, this was recommended by Brian Bayer, who I believe you emailed back and forth a little bit. And Brian has done a lot of research on um, uh, the drum forums and uh, tried to put together a little bit of the history himself. And we kind of figured, why not go to the man himself, um, Mr. Don here? So, so yeah, Don, why don't you go back and tell us about the origins of um, of Corder? And I'll spell it out for people. It's C-O-R-D-E-R. There's connections to fives. There's acrylic drums. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so. Tell us about quarter drums. Okay. Well, quarter drums was basically my dad. When he was young, he was pushed off the steps of the school where he went to school and he bruised his heel mm. and he got um, tuberculosis of the bone in his heel. Oh my God. And I don't know if you're familiar with that disease or not, but um, he was bedridden for two years. Oh. Wow. And he, his leg, basically, his hip just disintegrated. So he had a built-up shoe, probably six inches and um, on one leg. And, you know, he never considered himself handicapped at all. And so when he was in, I think, in high school, he ordered a drum set. And back then, there was no local music store. You know, he ordered it from Ludwig, I think. And um, started playing the drums. He worked his way through college. He had no help from his mom. He was a he was a single. You know, she was a didn't have a husband at the time. Mm-hmm. His dad had passed away from tuberculosis. Jeez, what year was he born? And Just so we we know that he was born in nineteen twenty one. Okay, yeah, he worked his way through college playing the drums with a big band. Cool. You know, they would play all these gigs and he would say, actually made enough money to send money home to his mom. And so um, when he got out of college, he, he opened a music store. He was he was just into music. He liked music, but he was a businessman. That's what he got his degree on in college. Yeah. And um, so he, you know, continued to play drums. We moved back to Huntsville and. Then I think it was in the middle to late sixties. He had a retail store here also because he had had one in Tuscaloosa and then he moved up here to Huntsville and he opened up another music store. And then he started thinking about the acrylic drums, you know, plexiglass plastics was big and coming on in the in the sixties. Yeah. And so he made a, a plexiglass drum and um, I remember I was, it was just so far ago, but I was, I remember riding my bicycle over to where he was working on, on the drum. And, um, it just didn't mean anything to me. I just kept riding my bicycle. And, uh, anyhow, he, um, finished the drum and contacted Ludwig, uh, drum company about, you know, what kind of interest they might have in that drum. And according to my dad, he took it up and met mm. with Bill Ludwig. Wow. And dad got behind the curtain and, and played one of Ludwig's snare drums. And he played his, his snare drum that he'd made. And Ludwig picked his snare drum as the better sounding <laughs> one. He thought it was his. <laughs> the blind taste and, test kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, so dad tried to work something out with Ludwig, but Ludwig, um, and dad ha- actually had gotten a patent on what he thought was clear, you know, plexiglass drums. But at the time, Zico's and I don't know who all else was involved in that. There was a bunch of people yeah. doing that at the same time. Yeah. And come to find out the, um, dad was pushing his drums as you could change inserts out. You could have a, champagne sparkle one night and a blue you know sparkle the next week you just take the head off put a different insert that is so i was looking into that a little online and that is to me just such an awesome idea like 
I, I mean, so you just explained it really well, but just for my own, you know, brain to wrap around it. So you basically, like you said, you take the head off and then I guess there'd be little, you know, holes to kind of fit around the, 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 you know, the screws for the lugs, but yeah, you're changing it to you have blue drums one night. Then like you said, sparkle. I mean, that is such a good idea yeah. and you can only do that because they're clear acrylic drums and you can see through them. So it's just like, correct. Oh my God. I mean, I've never heard of that. So that's what his patent was on. Wow. So he act when Ludwig started making the, um, the one distal lights or whatever yep. the shaded colors yep he tried to tried to sue them and there was a law firm in atlanta that looked at it and they go no no you don't have a case yeah. we're sorry you know you just don't have a case so you know years passed and then dad sold his music store and then found himself kind of floundering he didn't know what to do you know Saw all the money going out and nothing coming in. Mm. So then he started a custom clear drum company and yes. started making um, plexiglass shells. And he would take people's drum sets if they were, they wanted, he would change them over, drill the holes to match their hardware and just basically change their whole shells out to acrylic shells. Wow. So he would just use, like if you have a Ludwig kit or whatever, he would use their hardware, their hardware, you know, because yes. online yeah. there's some there's some like forums and things people are talking about, like, gosh, that's like like, like they look at these. I, I think there was some documentation about custom clear drum company, which is in, you know, obviously in Alabama. And they would say there's so much different hardware, which that makes perfect yeah. sense because it's just. Yeah, it was just whatever they had at the time and whatever dad could come up with. If he made a drum set, it was made from. Just whatever he could scavenge, man. You know, he sounds so, sounds like a very um, uh, like a businessman, like you said, but also just like an inventor, like a very like. Well, I can, you know, like he just he got it done. You know, oh yeah, he's got. I I looked through the patent file. I was trying to look at find the patent on the um, the um, the drums, the yeah. interchangeable inserts. But I couldn't find it. I could find one on the flute lyre. I could find one on the, um, he had one for a bass drum with protective feet. Hmm. Um, he had one on, um, the music flip folder. He had, oh, he had, he had several, you know, he tried to, he yeah. tried to patent everything and I don't, it never worked out for him, but that's okay. You know, you know, they got, they got to have the, the guy who's just, who's, who's doing it. I mean, there's, there's something so impressive about that. And I briefly looked into like, now I feel like it's a little different, probably now versus then i don't know which side which one would be easier or harder but man patenting anything is really not easy and 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 it's expensive and it takes time and again this is a many years later in 2021 or at that point i think it was 2020 when i was looking into it but um so good for him i mean he's just he's covering all his bases yeah, trying to yeah he was, a, he was a sharp fellow yeah really Okay, so um, better better man than me is all I can say. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, honestly, that's awesome that your dad is such an important person to you. Um, so uh, I'm just interested too about, and I think I was talking about this with um, when I was doing the Zikos episode with Wes Falconer, who um, who who knew Bill Zikos because he he's kind of known as the f the inventor of like the acrylic drum, which it sounds like that's still. Sort of holds true. I know there's other people doing multiple things, but it seems like your dad was like, okay, other people are doing this. And I think there is usually like a two or three people can kind of be experimenting at the same time. And it's like who comes first to market sort of thing. So, but right, how yeah. did your dad, like, was he working with a company who was manufacturing like a plastics manufacturer or um, the actual production of the early acrylic the custom clear drum company which was the original company i mean how did he get these shells made how did how did that do you know how that went well he worked with a local plastic company they had they had a like a big furnace they would put a, a sheet and they would cut the sheet to the size for the height of the drum and then they would put it in a um a big oven to heat it up to where it was pliable and then they would roll it over on a, um, basically a, uh, a mold mm. 
which would be the inside diameter of, you know, um, the, the shell basically. Sure. And, um, so then, so you had the outside diameter that would fit the head and then you would bevel, bevel the edges where they came together and then, um, use a, some type of a cement hmm. to, to bond the two together. And you could actually buff that out and make it almost, um, you know, totally transparent. You could, it would be sometimes hard to see where the seam was. Wow. And then you'd have to, you know, route the edges t- to, um, to make a, a good bearing edge on the, on the, the shell. Yeah. Now do you, um, what did the badge, did he have like a nice badge that said custom? Clear no, drum you know, company? when we had the drum company, we never had a badge. We didn't, we didn't serialize any of the drums. Um, yeah, we just made them. You know, we 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 were just we didn't know what we were doing. To be honest with you, we we just did the best we could with what we had, and in uh, um, there was no really no there was a sticker mm. that we stuck on the drum, but there was no badge like where the tone hole is. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. There was there was never a badge put on, which makes on you wonder drums like that how many are floating around um, just kind of like un uh, unlabeled, if you know what I mean? Like, uh, like maybe there are people are thinking they're like a Japanese drum or something um, when really they were from you guys. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So anyhow, when dad had the custom clear drum come, he had a guy named Terry Cornette that worked, that came and worked with him. And, um, Terry was a drummer. He still is a drummer. You know, he worked with the Hansel Symphony and he um, um, worked with dad with Custom Clear Drum Company until dad basically, you know, he was doing that. And then people knew he had a music store before and they would come in and they'd go, you know, can you get me some guitar strings in? Can you get me this? Can you get me that? So he ended up just basically merging into a, full music retail store again and um the the custom clear kind of just floundered just laid on the side and so dad dad was a um a martin guitar authorized dealer and so the martin dealer knew that dad piddled in drums and one day he just asked him he said you know we're making these drums and we're a guitar company and we're kind of wanting to get out of the drums. Would you be interested in buying, you know, the inventory? Hmm. Dad goes, yeah. You know, so they sent him a big list of the stuff that they had and it was worth, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. according to what they had listed. And, My older brother, Gary, was working with dad at the store. He'd already graduated from college. And um, dad said, I don't have the money. I don't have that kind of money to buy this. I would love to do it. And my older brother, Gary, says, make him an offer. Yeah. And he said, just lowball it. Make him an offer. (laughs) They can can refuse it or they can take it. Yeah. So dad dad made him an offer. And by George, they accepted it. Wow. So it was in, I think, the early winter of 79 when they shipped that stuff down from Pennsylvania. Three tractor trailer loads. Wow. And and I mean, you know, we got to say, too, that that the it was fives. I mean, so they. Uh, yes, it was fives. Yes, yes. So, but we we weren't able to buy. We weren't able to use the five names because yeah, Martin uh, was still making drumsticks under sure. the fives names, and they would not relinquish that name. Yeah, which was uh, you know that's okay. We were we were just wanting to make drums. Yeah, yeah. So, um, there is a fives episode out there that people can check out with Tommy Robertson. So basically. C.F. Martin acquired Fives in 1970-ish, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but then they so so just to kind of you know reiterate all that, then they sold it to your dad, the drum, the 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 equipment, and like the tooling, and just 
so he just now had basically right. like a drum factory. Right. Yes. In yeah. 1979. I mean, the molds, the, the die casting dies to make all the lugs, the tom mounts, um, um, the floor leg mounts. Wow. Um, everything. And mm. so we got that stuff. And they, we didn't have a place to put that. So we, we rented some space in the Huntsville Industrial Complex, our center, which was an old um, textile mill built in the 1800s, I think. Mm. It was old, you know. Yeah. And um, we were there probably two months, maybe. Because I, I actually looked it up, and then um, it was in February of 1980. They don't know how it happened, but that meal caught on fire. We were in yes. the basement. We were there. We had a solid slab of concrete above us, oh, wow. which the building sat on. And we were in the basement, huh. and um, that building burned to the ground. And I remember going up to Dad's house. And you could he kind of lived up on a, a hill that you could kind of look out over Huntsville and we could see that thing burning. Wow. And I'm, I'm standing there and, um, d these explosions happen, you know, you see, you, sure. you see something happen and then all of a sudden you hear a big boom <laughs> and I'm, I go, well, there goes my settling tank, you know, cause I had all, I had stuff down there that I was using to build stuff to, yeah. uh, we had to wall in an area. The whole area downstairs underneath that slab was just open. And you told them how much space you needed. And then you built a wall around the space that you rented. And it was kind of kind of unique. Yeah. And um, so it burned to the ground. And because of that, Dad was um, eligible for a small business administration loan. and we acquired a piece of property or he acquired a piece of property and built a building, 5,000 square foot building, hmm. which was packed the first day we moved in. Wow. It was, it was, and then I really, when I started acquiring machines to do the stuff that I wanted to do to make parts, cause that's what I did. Yeah. Dad was, dad was the president, you know, he was, he was, he was everything. Hmm. My older brother, Gary, was the uh, numbers cruncher. He would, he when we were in production, he would go stand by whoever was doing what they were doing and time them. <laughs> and really, wow. he crunched, he made, he came up with the prices of the things that we, yeah, we, uh, someone's got to do it. We sold. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. what he did. Wow. And then, um, man. And, uh, well, wow. I got to mention my younger brother too, Kim, my younger brother, he ended up, doing all the uh, lacquer finishes on the shelves. He got really good at that. Mm, that's awesome. I didn't realize so, how much of a family. Uh, I mean, I knew it was your dad and you, but what? that's great. So it's awesome. Your brothers were involved as well. Oh, yeah. 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 Couldn't have done it without yeah. you know, everybody's everybody's help. And Terry Cornett, the guy I mentioned earlier, yep. um, he came and worked for us. Oh, huh, that's cool. And um, a guy named Bill Von Camp that dad knew through the music store came and worked. And he's the one that started that actually ended up covering all the shelves. And he opened up a business later on after we sold and, um, was, um, selling drum shells and covering and stuff like that. Mm, so cool. But me, I'm stuck. I'm stuck back in my corner. I, I was just like, where I was in school yeah. basically. Yeah. And, learning how to, I made, you will not, you cannot imagine how many parts, individual parts go into making a drum and a drum set. Sure. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Really to make and it so actually happen. We, uh, yeah. we, we basically had, you know, most of that stuff outsourced. And then I would go, dad, if I can get this laid, I can make this part. And yeah. so I, we started buying machines a, a little at a time, bought a, you know, a milling machine. Um, mm. 
and I could make, I ended up making some dies to do the, the stamping yeah. of, um, of, you know, you know, metal parts, part of the hoops made, made things to make, to make the, um, snare hoop had a bridge on it. It wasn't just a cutout. It actually had a bridge on it because the fibers throw off, which we ended up manufacturing, um, you know, it kind of did drops down quite a bit. So that bridge had to clear hmm. um, the edge of the hoop to allow the snares to drop down off the snare side of the shell. Yeah, man. Well, let me ask you this. All right. So backing up before we get too far forward, I have a couple, two questions. All right. So the fire, um, yeah. that, that happened. Okay. But you guys, you said you were under that huge concrete slab. Was most of your stuff salvageable or was everything destroyed uh, because you had that? It, giant blocks it's weird if you if we were close to a, a window close to the outside it's like a basement with a window up the top yeah there was still enough heat that it would ignite it the wall that with the plate the um, plywood wall that we built caught on fire and burned just like a wick yeah it just burned down and um so there were no wooden shells there were a few plexiglass shells and they went up you know we had we had a lot of hoops that were underwater because we were in the basement and they're flooding water on everything they could yeah, put it out. True. Well, it, it flooded. It flooded downstairs. Everything was pretty much. So we had a lot of um, tension rods, um, gosh, die cast parts, mm. you know, lugs. Lugs melted. They just, some of them were just in a big glob. Yeah. Uh, an ingot so to speak yeah <laughs> and um it God. was a mess but it was, was a the, real mess was the equipment like i mean because you bought all that your dad bought all that fibes stuff was that could you then i mean it's giant metal equipment i mean was it salvageable itself the actual like oh yeah okay so yeah i was gonna say yeah the, we, the five we were stuff able we on. were able to salvage we, you know we had two we got two punch presses obi which was oh you know i don't Drummers probably don't care anything about this, but OBI, I mean, just got an open back and it's it climbable. So okay. you can kind of tilt it back and, and parts would stamp and they'll just fall off. Okay. They'll like, fall off or, or shoot through the bottom of the, of the die when you stamp parts. Yeah. Those were fine. Those were fine. The, the machine that we, that we got from, um, with the company, um, to, we would actually get blanks hoop blanks metal hoop blanks like the triple flange hoop blanks and we could set them on this machine and index them um and flare them out to punch holes for six eight ten or twelve um plug drums hmm. and that needed a little bit of work after it but it was you know it was still totally still usable man they, and, they um, built it to last it's to, to, to oh yeah, through yeah. A fire and literally like fire hose amount of water coming down. Um, wow. And then, all right. So my other question too, just to clarify for myself, just with, with the fives acquisition was, w did that get you guys, uh, shell manufacturing stuff or was it really mainly just like hardware, uh, manufacturing, um, machinery or was it everything? So were you creating then f shells was, with the fives, uh, equipment? It was pretty much everything. I remember they had a um, a big apparatus, for for lack of a better term. Yep. And it had it had pillar block bearings. It was two eight inch um, I beams that were connected, and long shafts from one I beam to the other supported by pillar block bearings. And then on the end of that shaft was a big plate, aluminum plate that you could mount different cylinders to that were made out of, you know, aluminum. And that's what they used to, when they would make a fiberglass shell, they would put the mat in there and then spin it and start adding. I, 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 I'm going by the way yeah. I thought they would have done it. Sure. Cause I never saw it done. Yep. Um, and then they would add the resin to it. And since it's being spun, like, uh, like the, the centrifugal force would, throw the resin out and you just keep spinning until, until it's set up. Mm. And that's how they made, I assume that's how they made the shells. We never, we never got into that. Yeah. I think we ended up 
selling that to somebody, and I don't know why, but um, it was just in the way. Well, I was gonna us. before we started. I was just gonna say that uh, we talked about how your dad didn't want to get involved with fiberglass. <laughs> he said, he that said, is correct. Yeah, he said no, yeah. uh, which that seems like a lot of work. I think it just goes to show that it's it's awesome for the companies that did and do, but. Uh, I get that your dad didn't want to get involved with um, fiberglass. So you guys were typically wood shells at that point. Um, I'm assuming acrylic sort of. Um, some acrylic, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. But he he was basically pushing the wood shells. Yeah. So that makes sense. A little bit they easier. They were easier to work with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. A lot easier. We would, buy, we would buy long tubes from a company who's no longer in business. I think Jasper Wood Products was the one, the company that we, we got shells from the first time. And they made all kinds of, of uh, plywood products, uh, tables. I think, I don't, I don't know what all they made, but they could set up and, and make the shells and they would. Sure. And we would get like a 16 inch diameter shell, maybe, you know, 36 feet or 36 inches long yeah. or 32 inches long. So you cut it in half to make, to 16 by 16 four times that makes sense and and then, um, then you're making all of the uh hardware and all that stuff to put on there out of all that that you know great equipment you were there in the corner <laughs> stamping things yes out and- i was in the corner and that was my little world I'm, i remember my brother gary coming back there and timing me and i'm standing there and he just started laughing he goes you don't even realize i'm here do you <laughs> and i startled i go you know, no, I, I don't. I'm so involved in what I'm doing wow. that um, he just he just basically started laughing. So, yeah, I was in my own little world back there. And uh, I loved it. I loved it. I loved making new things. It was a challenge to me to make to make things. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's neat to me, too, to like if you if you look at a, you know, quarter drums, just to think that like how much hands-on stuff from your family, from the quarter family is, is, is involved in, in these drums. Um, it really makes it, you kind of look at them a little different. It's just a, you know, a small American brand in, in, especially in Alabama, you don't really, I'm sure there's some others, but, um, man, you don't hear too many, hear of too many drum brands in Alabama. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what, don't let this secret out. Alabama is a great state to live in. Sure. But, we don't want anybody else coming here. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're getting enough people moving in. <laughs> yeah. The secret's probably already out. Yeah. So but it's a great place. That's uh, good to know. All right. Well, uh, let's get back on the timeline here. And, and, um, so your dad got you, you, you guys, your dad got the small business loan. You're in your new, um, you know, we'll call it a factory. Um, take it from there. What, what year was that? happening the 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 transfer over to the new after the fire oh it probably taught it probably took about uh, eight months to a year to get the building done where we can move in yeah and they there's that old saying about most businesses don't recover after a fire like you know like restaurants and stuff so you guys that that was a real trial yeah yeah we weren't hurt too bad you know the die cast uh dies were off of a die caster up in the uh, northeast somewhere. I, don't, I I forget the name of that company. Boy, that's so uh, <laughs> the things that were actually made the the major part of the things that we used on drums, um, wasn't there. They weren't even they weren't even in house. Yeah, yeah, that's lucky, so. man. All right, so carry on with the uh, history there. Um, what happened after that? And and were you guys at that point? Maybe we we also talk a little bit about your uh, public. Uh, image and like, you know, how quarter was doing in the, cause you, you know, the whole goal is to sell the drums. So how are things going with, with selling and getting these things out in the world? Well, that's what dad, dad was, a, he was a salesman and that's what, that's what he did. You know, he was all constantly doing that. It never ended, yeah. you know, never ended. Um, he wanted to get into the marching band. Oh, sure. Line of drums. And so we got into that. And uh, my older brother commented, "We're making we're making lots of money on the quads when we would do when we would make quads." He said, "We're not making so much on the bass drums, but we're we're killing it on the quads." <laughs> so <laughs> more quads, <laughs> yeah. 
That's great. It's a never ending market there. Um, the marching band world. Oh, and those folks can, those folks can destroy a snare drum. <sighs> really? They crank it down to where you're like banging on a tabletop. I, I don't understand that, but I, I'm not a drummer. So, yeah. Um, well, that, that was one of my questions later was cause, cause a lot of people who work in, uh, drum manufacturing aren't drummers. So you yourself were not a, uh, a drummer. I'm sure you've, you've played the drums. No, few, you know, no, sometimes, but. Not, my, my older brothers was saxophone and, and keyboard. And, uh, um, I finally started playing the guitar a little bit. My younger brother played mandolin for a little while, but he, he hadn't, uh, he hadn't picked that up in years. So we weren't really a music musically inclined family. Sure. Well, your manufacturers and, and, and that's all, that's pretty important right there. Um, all right. So, um, quarter, you know, I, as, as I'm seeing, it was, it was going strong until about, um, the, in like 1990 ish. So what happened? So we, we, we were in the late started in the late, late seventies, 79, so um, then take us through there. So the 80s were pretty good. What, what, what were some milestones along the way there? Uh, as far as things were just, you know, to me, rolling smooth. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, we were, we were actually sitting at a table. I can't remember what we were, were producing. Dad walks up, and his eyes are crossed. And I'm, I'm going, what's up with that, you know? Yeah. He, um, he started having problems with um, not his mental capacity at that time, but he started having things go wrong. Mm. And he just told me one day, in fact, he told me, but I've come to find out he didn't tell my older brother or my younger brother. He said, I got something going on. Mm. He said, I need to get out of this business. And um, so then he pursued trying to, you know, trying to, get a buyer to buy the, the business and we we tried to keep it from the, all the employees but they knew something was up they would go what's going on we're not coming out with a new catalog you know what something's going on I, I didn't know what to tell them so i just went back to my little corner and I kept making yeah kept making parts <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, geez. Um, well, i'm sorry to hear that come, I mean, to find, come, tough. come to find out dad um he died in 1999 of alzheimer's Mm. Um, the last, last six months of his life, he, he couldn't, he, if he tried to speak, it was words you had never heard. He couldn't even speak the English language anymore. It was, yeah. he would just make up words. And I don't know how someone with Alzheimer's can make up words, but he wow. did. And, uh, it was very, really sad to, to yeah. Yeah. see him go through that. And yeah. I do remember there was a guy that worked for us also for a little while, Artie Dean. And Dean's not his real name. It's Stutzenberger or something. I forget what it is. Marianne Ramsey, who was our secretary, she had to write the check. So she couldn't write a check to Artie Dean because that wasn't his real name. Mm. So she had to write the check to his, his you know, what was on his birth certificate, I guess, or yeah. social security card. Anyhow, he, he approached me. He was into this vintage stuff. And, and uh, he said, can you make these two blokes? And I go, yeah, I, yeah, I can make that. So he said, well, I can sell them if you can make them. So I started trying to, you know, to, to make some of the two blokes. And then dad and my brothers found out. They said, you can't do that, you know. You can't come in here and make something that we could sell. Um, and so I, I felt bad about Artie because I told him we could do it, but we, I couldn't. So we started making um, snare drums with two blugs. Yeah, cool. And um, I don't know if anybody else was doing that at the time or not. I really don't. I, I don't know, you know, what was... Um, on the in the drum market at that time i was just in my own little world yeah so we we made the we made two blugs we made i remember we made um let's see the six and a half eight inch snares six and a half and the regular size snares i think we made some piccolo snares yeah. out of out of two blugs too 
Cool. And that ended up being a pretty, pretty big hit. Yeah. Um, everybody's kind of started wanting two blokes. And, um, uh, so that was the start of that, which I still do. I still make some two blokes. Oh um, yeah. They're, they're popular today. I mean, I even think of like in the mid two thousands, there was like a big boom with, with, with two blugs. I mean, they've been, they are cool. I mean, they're really, really neat, um, drums. What about, uh, so in that, um, you know, let's say in the eighties were, what about endorsees and stuff? I'm, I'm, I was looking earlier on, I think the drummer world, um, discussion, like the forum. And I think Bermuda Schwartz, um, who, yeah, yeah. you know, plays with weird yeah. Al, I believe he said he was an endorser. What, what other endorsees, you know, people playing your drums. Did you guys have, I think, I think a guy named Barrett Deans. Yeah. Was an endorsee. Yeah. The world's fastest drummer, quote unquote, at some point in time, which I know is debatable. Uh, but Buddy didn't like that. <laughs> Pretty sure Buddy yeah, Rich, but well, yeah, yeah, cool. And another guy, and gosh, I can't remember his name. He went into the Guinness's World Book of Records for playing the drums the longest. I don't think he used one of our drums, but I think he used some of the sticks. Dad actually came up with a, a nylon tip, but it was a nylon sleeve mm. and um, that you could take a drum stick and run it through this. It's like a pencil sharpener, and, and it would cut it down to where the sleeve would fit on I mean, You just glue that, you know, because if you're doing a rim shot with a, um, you know, on a snare drum, sometimes your sticks would fray yeah. further up. The, of course, yeah. And that was supposedly to keep the stick from fraying if you did a rim shot. So mm, smart. Um, He's an inventor. I don't know. Uh, yeah, he was. He really was. He saw a need and he wanted to come up with something to fill that, that void that mm. wasn't there. So. Yeah. But wow. To, and, and throw anything else out there, but really that, that, that 1979 to 1990, I mean, like you said, it's, you know, depending on where in the, in 79, pretty much that's 10 years, um, 11 years, like, really got going and a lot of ups and downs in a pretty short amount of time there. I mean, that is um, to, to, to become a drum company that people are still talking about 31 years later after it, you know, went closed the doors. Um, it's pretty amazing. That's, you should be proud of your, your family. Yeah. Well, I am. I'm still, um, still trying to, do things that our family started sometimes such as the two blokes but yeah i'm slowing down on that i just can't i can't stand and, and buff a, a, a uh, buffing machine yeah for the hours it takes to do it oh anymore. yeah so. yeah i'm sure so um you know again like i said throw anything else in and if i'm if i'm uh if i'm missing anything there in the um in the 80s but what happened with um towards the end there. I mean, I know I remember in, with the fives episode, there was like a radio programmer, um, Sammy Darwin, right? I think he kind of took, yeah, he was the yeah. buyer, right? Dad, dad sold the, the drum company to Sammy Darwin. And, um, when they, when they actually bought it, they drove over from Iuka, Mississippi. It was a two hour one way drive every day. Jeez. They would hop in a car and take off and drive over to Huntsville and um, work all day and then turn around and drive back and um, to learn the process of what we were doing and um, showing them how everything went mm -hmm. and how, you know, how the process of we, that we went through for making the drums. Yeah. And um, they did that. Until, as I remember looking, I went into business in 1991. So somewhere in that transition period was when Darwin finally came over with a bunch of trucks, and they loaded all everything up into those trucks. And mm. I stayed there for a little while. I had all my stuff in a uh, in a, in another corner. <laughs> <laughs> And walled off. I said, this stuff doesn't go. And uh, wow, I had a one little screw machine that I had personally bought that I made um, the uh, threaded inserts. You know, the, the inserts that go inside the um, the die cast lug. Sure. Um, 
I bought I bought the cams to do uh, um, to do that part, and that was amazing you know, to watch that machine because um, it would it would drill, and then uh, it would center drill, drill, and then tap the the part, and then turn the outsides down to a threaded insert and mm. part it off. And it would do one every 14 seconds. Wow. And that machine just sat there and ran, and it still runs in my shop the same way. Just That's what I make the, the post for the tube lugs on is that machine now. Man, sometimes um, you look at this hardware and you forget that like, um, well, a lot of times now it is like just a, a robot or something, but you look at, you forget that the threading and these, the buffing is done by a person. Um, oh, yeah. It's yeah. just amazing. So you were doing your own thing there. If they if they sold everything else, so you were doing, were you doing hardware? Um, obviously for quarter, but in in the you know ninety and on, then did you continue making drum hardware on your own? And I know you said you're still kind of working on it. I mean, what what's yeah, the story with that? Just the tube lugs, which is only a brass you know sure. a brass tube lug. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I really didn't have a. a source to sell anything else and a lot of that stuff's hard to make you know um the die cast parts you got to build a die casting die and have a company that run it for you because i you know you can't you can't run that stuff in the house unless you got a big shop and a big place to put a big die cast machine yeah um sure so yeah wow and you can but you're you know, still just, selling them correct you can still buy people can buy tube lugs from you right yeah yeah and i i make them i had one guy um he thought my prices were a little high which i don't think they are but um you know yeah he he asked about a size i said where else can you get that size made sure. you know i can make them any size you want yeah up Custom. to 15 inches long from one inch up to 15 inch anything in between and um, I don't think China's making that. They'll make certain sizes, you know, and sell those certain sizes. But for a custom length drum or tube lug, um, I don't know anybody else that was doing it. There mm -hmm. may be. I'm sure there are. Yeah, but, of course. But it's cool. It's just because it's you and it's got the history. And, and um, you know, I'll say that people can go to quarter, C O R D E R products dot com and, uh, you know, you can keep Don busy <laughs> in his corner. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> making some of those tube lugs. Wow. Thank you, Bart. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, what an unbelievable um, story. I mean, that's it's. Um, it had to be pretty upsetting to like uh, sell your this brand. I mean, obviously, your dad faced a situation where he kind of had to, um, and it seemed like it yeah, was. Yeah, he was he, point, but, there, he knew there was no future for him. You know, yeah. that's just sad to say. My older brother had actually gone back and gotten his uh, mechanical engineering degree. Mm. So he, I guess he saw the writing on the wall. And uh, my younger brother went back and got his uh, degree in finance. And I went back to the school of hard knocks and just didn't do anything except learn to keep my hands greasy on working on machines and yeah. stuff like that. So, Boy, but you guys... <laughs> You learned because of this drum company, or you—you you kind of like you learned Absolutely. what you could. Absolutely, I do. learned so much. If I knew then what I know now, oh, it'd have been Katie bar the door because there's no telling what we could have been making. And yeah, it was a great, absolutely great learning experience for me. That's awesome. And um, mm. yeah, wow. Just eBay. eBay wasn't out at the time where you can go on and buy tools. Um, to put on these machines to make the parts, oh, it's that's that place is. I tooled up my machines through um, buying stuff off eBay. Really, wow, yeah, really. these old. I'm sure there's everything's worth something to someone. You know what I mean? Where like if 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 you come across stuff like that, you can you can always part it out. And then guys like you who need that <laughs> one. Oh yeah, specific yeah. thing. Oh. <laughs> wow fascinating knurling tools you know um oh gosh yeah mm. die cast or uh, the die heads 
to, to do the threading of an outside, um, you know, screw. Sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Well, so, you know, um, I still think that your dad's idea about those inserts, um, did anything ever come of that? Like, did any of those exist out in the world? Cause I think that obviously it'd have to be done right where they're not like sliding off or like they have to be connected correctly, but did anything ever come yeah, of that? No, nothing ever, ever came of it that I know of. Cause really to do it right, you would have to take one head off. And then you would have to go in there and take all the screws out. Yeah. Oh, I see. And then put the insert in and then everything match up with the, you know, the holes match up with the, your insert, um, your new sp blue sparkle or whatever to match up with the hole pattern for the screws. And, um, it would just, it just, it was labor intensive to, yeah. to change out an insert. Obviously, it would look a little different than if it was a nice blue sparkle wrap on the outside. So you'd have to play with your um, what finishes look great and and all that stuff. Um, so I'm sure there'd be a lot of. It's cheaper than buying a new drum set in a different color. <laughs> you right. know? Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you could also uh, put lights in one. You oh could sure. Do, you could do Christmas lights. You could do anything. You know. I I don't know if Dad's patent. You know, which is uh, has expired years years ago. Um, yeah. if anything like that could be done or you could do somebody with an artistic mind could make a drum set just shine. Exactly. So <laughs> That'd be awesome. Cool. Well, Don, um, this is all fascinating and I want to let everyone know who's listening. Don is going to be kind enough to do a, uh, Patreon, the bonus episode that we do on the show. And, um, we decided that it'd be fun to talk about, um, catalogs with quarter. And cause I think that's an interesting, uh, sub, you know, we didn't really talk much about that. And it's, 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 you're putting your best foot forward and you're presenting your drums in the best light in this catalog. And I'm sure it's behind the scenes, always a little chaotic and some, some funny things can happen there. So, um, if you want to check out that and then many other bonus episodes, go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a become a patron button. So you can go there and check it out. And Don and I will record that episode right after we finish this one here shortly. But um, Don, I want to thank you for being here and sharing your family's story with me. Um, it's it's uh, you're, you should be, like I said, and you are, you should be very proud. And your dad, Jim Corder, just seems like a great businessman um, who his legacy is still going uh, strong today. So, and, and then also Brian Bayer, B-E-Y-E-R. Thank you so much for connecting me with Don and emailing and all that good stuff. Um, so, Don, yeah, thank you so much for being here. No, well, you're welcome. It was a, a pleasure to uh, share what little information I had. So, yeah, <laughs> it was great. great. Thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.